Hey, how's it going? Jeff Lerner here. And in this video, we are going to discuss if it's really possible to invest in real estate with no money out of pocket. Uh, I'm going to actually show you that, yes, it is possible. And I'm going to show you two specific strategies that you can use to actually get started in real estate with no money out of pocket. And even better than that, I'm actually going to take you over to my computer uh, where we can actually look inside a couple deals that I've actually done that illustrate how you can put these strategies uh, into practice in, in real world examples. So this should be a really exciting session. If you've ever wanted to get into real estate, uh, but you don't have a lot of money to work with, I think this is going to be a huge video for you to watch. So without further ado, uh, let's take a look. All right, so uh, yeah, as mentioned in this video, we're gonna be looking at how to uh, invest in real estate with no money out of pocket. Now, the first thing I wanna, I wanna make abundantly clear before we kind of dive into this, into the, the nitty gritty of this is that there's no such thing as investing in real estate with no money. Uh, real estate's extremely valuable intrinsically. It's, it's the only, <laughs> currency in the world, so to speak, that they can't actually create any more or less of. It's, it's literally land. The key is, if you don't have a lot of your own money, you have to learn to use other people's money. So before we get into the nitty gritty again, I want to kind of set the paradigm here of, of investing in real estate and frankly, just resourcefulness and entrepreneurialism in general, which is that you, you never say I can't afford it and you never worry about not having enough money because the bottom line is if you don't have enough money, if you're limited by financial resources to do deals or investments or start the business that you want, it's not actually a problem of a money shortage. It's a problem of a skill set shortage. And by that, I mean, if you had the requisite skills for communication, the requisite skills for networking, the requisite skills for putting a business plan together, uh, then you would never be short of money. If you knew, and think about that, if you knew how to you know, find a good deal, package it up, put it on paper so that it presented as a good deal, and you knew how to articulate that and, and communicate, demonstrate the confidence to people, and you knew actually how to find people with money, you would never have to worry about not having money. Uh, again, networking, communication, uh, and basic understanding of business and the ability to translate that into a business plan or a prospectus or something that communicates the, the opportunity. Because the fact is, there's a ton of money. There are trillions of dollars out there parked, waiting for good deals. There are lots of millionaires. There are even some billionaires out there who love doing good deals. You just have to learn how to bring them good deals. And they're not all individuals. Some of our institutions, um, you know, most of the businesses that I started in my 20s, I either started online because uh, that doesn't require much money, uh, but I did real estate. I've been real estate investing. You know, a lot of people assume that I didn't start investing in real estate until I got into, you know, started making money with internet marketing, but I've actually been doing real estate investing longer than I've been doing internet business. And uh, I, when I got started, it was entirely with, um, you know, either money that I was able to pull off of credit cards or money that I was able to raise through investors who were willing to sort of put the capital up to, to go with my sweat equity. And this was when I was a jazz piano player and I was, you know, bird dogging, as they call it, deals during the day while I played piano gigs at night um, and, and so on and so forth. It's the, you get the point. It's, it's never a shortage of money. It's a limited either perspective and belief system about what's possible out there, or you just haven't developed the skills to go get the money. So that said, let's talk about the next step of two actual strategies that you can do to go do real estate deals with no money. The first one is something that's actually emerged uh, fairly recently. And, and by the way, I, I'm not actually going to teach you how to go uh, solicit or partner with investors. Because even though that's that's how I got started, I recognize it for a lot of people that sounds really, really daunting to uh, maybe go sell yourself, especially if you're new, you don't have a lot of experience and to walk in with the confidence and say, hey, I, I want you to put your invest your money in me. Like I get there's a certain swagger that not everybody sees themselves having to go do that. So I'm not actually going to say go find an investor. I'm actually going to give you two kinds of deals um, that rem that remove your personality from the equation. They remove your personal uh, characteristics and they're just 
they're things that you can do that basically they make sense on paper and that's all that matters is they don't have you don't have to be any better than the paper to do these two strategies the first is actually to go lease properties and then turn around and sublease them on airbnb um, this is something that's new that's emerged in the last you know several years as a possibility obviously this wasn't around when i got started 15 years ago um, but I'm going to give you a real world example of how this could work. And actually, I'm going to show this to you, not from the point of view of doing it, but from the point of view of a landlord or an owner, a property owner, um, and how I might be enticed for like, let's say you came to me and how I might respond and why it would make so much sense. Um, and this is exactly the same case that I make to other uh, other property owners, people who own a second home or maybe they own an investment property. And, and, and this, it just makes so much sense. Let me explain what I mean. So I have here on the map uh, a property that I actually own. It's a single family townhome, one bedroom, one bath. Uh, it's in the, uh, as you can see, I, I'm, I'm obscuring the address. I don't want like anybody to go like show up at this house, but it's in the uh, Medi Texas Medical Center area of Houston, a very desirable place uh, especially a desirable place for both long-term and short-term rentals. Obviously, a lot of you know medical students and residents, and uh, even you know just medical professionals, and just all kind. I mean, it's Houston; it's a booming area. Um, tons of demand for long-term rentals, but obviously short-term rentals too. You're near a medical center. It's close to um, Reliant Energy Stadium. I, I think they might have changed the name. I don't live in Houston anymore, but it's close to the football stadium. It's close to where a lot of action is. So big demand for short-term rentals. So this is a property that, you know, if you went to the, the tax records, you would find uh, that, that I own it, that it has an out-of-state owner you would see that the address of the owner, in fact, I live in Utah, the address of the owner is in a completely different state than the property address. As you go, oh, this is, a, this is owned by somebody, it's probably not their primary residence. Okay, um, well, let me, let me reach out to them or uh, maybe you know, go knock on the door. I mean, not this kind of thing, you, you start locally or maybe you go through the, the MLS records, you go you know, contact a realtor. But, but bottom line is you find a property that has an out of town or out of state owner. And I'll use this property as an example. So I get about almost $1,200. I think it's rented for $1,195 right now. Almost $1,200 a month in rent for this property. Just a one bedroom townhome. It's 1,100 square feet. In fact, I pulled it up on Zillow here. Um, so it's 1,100 square feet, one bed, one bath. But again, because it's close to the medical center and it's a, a full townhome, you know, two-story townhome, it gets a good rent for, for a single, uh, a one bedroom spot. But even still, um, $1,200 a month, let's pull up a site, and you may not know that of this site, but it's called airdna.co. And basically this site feeds in data from Airbnb, and oh, it pulls in data from another site too, I can't remember. Uh, oh yeah, HomeAway. I think it also pulls in VRBO, don't quote me on that. But anyways, it analyzes thousands and thousands of properties that are listed on the short-term rental sites. And it basically, you can scroll around. And so I can say, um, and this is, this is in the same area where I was looking. So you see here the Texas Medical Center. Oh, it's NRG Stadium. Yeah, look, that's where the, uh, the Texans play. And so my property is just south of this street here, which is called Old Spanish Trail, around here off of Fannin. It's in this cluster right here right next to the football stadium, right south of the medical center, uh, really close to Rice University, hugely desirable area. And again, as an out-of-state owner, I get about $1,200 a month in rent for this property. So let's look at these rentals. Uh, okay, this is a two-bedroom, two-bath that uh, pulls in $200 a night. That's just an apartment. Um, okay, here, $750 a day? That strikes me as a little excessive. Um, two bedroom, two bath, $174 a night, uh, $149. And by the way, if you go, if I were to uh, retrofit a, a one bedroom townhome into an Airbnb, I'd probably put in you know, bunk beds, or a, I'd probably put it, not bunk beds, I'd put in a, a pull-out bed in the living room. You would, you would bill this as a two bed, at least a two bed. Um, and you see all these 148, 195, 158, so 134. So you're basically getting 150 to $200 a night 
for a property like this in this area. So let's say you're looking to do a deal. You would come to me as a landlord and say, hey, you've got this property. Uh, you know, I see it listed. And let's say I had, I had listed it for rent. You would say, I see it listed for $1,200 uh, a month in rent. Well, I'm going to be real upfront with you. I actually want to uh, turn around and sublease the property on Airbnb. Um, here, you know, there's some advantages to doing that. Uh, obviously, I'll cover the cleaning cost. I'll make sure that it gets cleaned multiple times a month between every changeover. Uh, obviously, I'll take care of any repairs or short-term maintenance. Um, but just, you know, to be upfront, I'm, I would like to sublease it. But I'm willing to offer you $1,500 a month. That's $300 a month more than what you're asking. And I'll sign a 12-month lease. In fact, I'll even sign a 24-month lease, right? Now, me as a landlord, obviously, if I wanted to Airbnb be it myself and deal with the cleaning, and, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm probably more sophisticated in this regard than a lot of other people. There's a lot of people that they just don't want to deal with it. They don't want to deal with the hassle. They're comfortable with the money. They want the long term. They don't want to have to deal with it day to day. They don't want the liability. They're out of state. They can't see it, whatever. They, they don't want to have to manage it. You're giving them the same thing that they would get from a long term tenant, only it's actually better because you're offering to clean and upkeep and maintain the property and probably even nicely furnish the property or or, or improve, increase the value, or at least, you know, maybe add beds or furniture or something to the property, um, you're offering to do this, essentially you're giving them the same level of security and certainty and guarantee in a long-term lease, only at a higher than market value for long-term leasing. It's, a, it's a, like a total no-brainer. Um, y- you just have to learn how to have these conversations with landlords, but it's not about soliciting them as an investor. You're basically just calling them up as a tenant and saying, hey, I would like to pay you above market. I'd like to pay you more than what you're asking for rent and even potentially sign a longer term lease. And I can tell you as a landlord, I'm all over that deal. Um, now, I can't tell you that every, every property owner is. I say landlord. I don't manage the property. I just own it. But as an owner, uh, I'm all over that deal. I can't tell you that every owner is because some owners don't get it. Um, they just are scared of things that aren't traditional. But there's millions of owners out there and there's millions of properties that are not owner occupied. Um, and it's easy to find this if you just know how to do a little bit of digging. Um, and then, so let's say you, you know, let's say I say yes to $1,500 a month. You've got the property now at $1,500 a month. Um, you're probably going to have to get a management company. They have, you know, depending on if you live there and you're willing to be involved, um, there's actually typically three levels of management companies that deal with Airbnb rentals or short-term rentals. There's companies that'll just do the listing uh, on, on the short-term rental sites. There's companies that'll do the listings um, and they'll also deal with going to meet the owners and you know, do the key, the key exchange and all that. And then the kind of the most engaged level is they also do the maintenance and the cleaning. Um, and typically your fee for that is gonna be anywhere from 10 to 30%, depending on which, how engaged you wanna be um, or you want your management company to be. So let's say you get, you know, I mean, again, picking these numbers, $200 a night, even if you only rented it 20 out of 30 nights, which would be very, very realistic for uh, a property in a location like this, you're looking at $4,000 a month, 20 times 200, $4,000 a month. Remember, you're only paying 1500 for the rent. So, uh, you know, let's say you're, you're doing, uh, you know, let's say you go all in with the management company. You want them to handle everything. That's paying, you're paying 30% of gross receipts. So now you're down 1,200, now you're at 2,800. Um, plus let's say you pay, you know, an average of four or $500 a month for cleaning turnovers. So now you're down to 2,300, but you're only paying 1,500. You're making $800 a month, $9,600 a year, $10,000 a year, and completely passive income. And that's the most conservative, conservative example where you've got 100% property management, taking care of all of it, including the cleaning, the changeovers, everything. Any amount of that work that you're willing to do yourself only increases your profit margin. So you could make on a deal like this anywhere from 800 to probably $1,500 a month in passive income uh, just by approaching a, 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 a out of town or an out of market owner like me with a, with a deal that's better than what I'm currently getting or what I'm trying to get by listing my property. It's, it's, genius honestly it's it's such a cool model and it's available for anyone that wants to do it you just have to have learn how to have a reasonably intelligent conversation and 
And the biggest thing I can tell you as a, as a property owner is if I'm talking, and again, I, I have a property management company that does this for me, but they're going to say the same thing, which is they want to just feel confidence of the person on the other end of the line, that when you talk to them, you sound credible, you sound uh, articulate or mature, or just like you're not going to trash the property, which technically you're not going to do because if you trash it, you can't put it on Airbnb. So that's the thing that you have to really communicate to them is that their interest is also your interest, which is keeping the property in a highly rentable condition. A lot of uh, landlords, you kind of got to pivot their mindset that like Airbnb, it, it's not a way to get your property uh, trashed because you have short-term renters. It's actually a property, a way to get your property better maintained than most long-term renters because you have a maintenance guy and a clean and or a cleaning crew going in multiple times a month, fixing all the little things as they happen. Um, anyways, so that's one strategy. Hopefully you can see how cool and you know, what a win-win that is for everyone. The next strategy is a completely different approach and it's to actually go out and find properties that have, uh, that are in somewhat, you know, uh, disrepair and then have a huge upside for, um, based on either the area that they're in or just because of their condition, there's a big upside to repair the property. And the reason you want to look for these under, these sort of, uh, under serviced or under maintained properties that have a lot of upside is there are actually lenders that will loan you money solely on the basis of the after what they call the ARV, the after repaired value of a property. Um, so I'm actually going to show you the details of a property, uh, an actual deal that I did, uh, or that I'm actually in the process of doing. We're, we're literally on the tail end of it right now, where we literally took, this is the property. You should be able to see that. Um, this is the property that we bought. Uh, just a little kind of run down, small, they call them a shotgun house. You open the front door, you can shoot a shotgun all the way out the back door, just kind of a, a box, right? So that property, uh, this is in Atlanta, um, and you can see actually the details right here. So we bought this for, um, the total loan amount was 190,000, but of that $76,500 was the purchase price of this property. $113,500 was set aside for construction, and that made for a $190,000 loan. Now, what we did was we said, hey, for $113,000, we can actually turn this property into a very nice uh, four-bedroom, three-bathroom house. And, you know, we knew that we might have to come up with a little, a little extra cash. That budget might have been a little bit low. But, you know, the point is we basically spent sort of specked out what we thought we could do with that construction money. And we had an appraisal done. There's actually appraisers that'll say, if you did this work to this house, this is what, uh, you know, let's say a four bedroom, 2000 square foot house in that neighborhood would appraise for. And because we picked a rundown property in a neighborhood that had particular characteristics, um, the after repairs appraisal came in at $420,000. Now, most of these lenders will loan up to 70% of the ARV, the after repaired appraisal amount. So in this case, the lender would have loaned us as much as $294,000. In this case, uh, we only borrowed 190, which is only 45% of the ARV of the property. And because we borrowed a lower loan amount, a lower uh, percentage of loan to value ratio, they called it, we actually got a better, better interest rate. Um, that's why we did that. And because we knew that if we had to come up with a little, little extra construction money, we could out of pocket. But the fact is we could have borrowed up to almost $300,000, which is more than enough to turn this house, as it turns out, into this house. And again, we're almost done. Um, but look at that. So we have turned this little kind of rinky-dink shotgun house into this nice 2,000, I think it's about 2,200 square feet. Uh, four bedroom, two store. We actually added a second story house, and we're going to be able to sell it again. The after repairs estimated value is four hundred and twenty thousand. Now, obviously, we're going to have to pay realtor fees for that. You know, probably five, depending on the deal, five to six percent. We're going to probably pay five percent, so that's going to knock a little over twenty grand off. So we'll come in almost four hundred. 
um, on a deal that we owe 190 on uh, to pay off the original loan amount. So, you know, again, we used 100% of a lender's money. The lender put up all the money to acquire the house and to do the construction. Um, we have had uh, $1,500 a month in interest payments. So, and, and in this case, this deal, and this is actually a good deal to show you because this deal has been, frankly, not a very good one. There's been some things that have gone wrong and it's taken us almost two years to do the work, which, you know, it, it's, it was a Murphy's Law situation. I won't bore you with the details, but frankly, as you go into these things, you have to actually know that even if the worst case scenario happens, even if everything imaginable goes wrong, that you're not gonna lose your butt because that's the scary thing about real estate sometimes is that, yeah, there's a lot of leverage using other people's money, but when things swing the wrong way, you know, little levers swing really big doors, right? And when they swing the wrong way, it can really hurt you. So in this case, $1,500 a month in interest, but you're getting draw releases as the work is being done. So as long as the work is being done, you're actually getting money released back to you that you can, you can use to pay any interest costs. And you know, there's, there's a more detailed economics to this that we don't have time for in this video. I'm really just I'm trying to illustrate the concept for you. But think about this, even across two years, which is a massive delay, this whole thing, this thing should have taken six months, but it took two years um, for reasons I won't bore you with. At $1,500 a month interest, that means my interest charge, uh, 1500 that's $18,000 a year, that's $36,000 in interest. Even under that scenario that sounds horrible, we're still gonna be only into this property, you know, 190 was the loan amount, 113 was the construction budget. Uh, we went over on interest, probably $25,000. So now you're at 215, 220. Remember, we're talking about selling this property after fees for almost $400,000. There was so much margin to work with that even if we had a $50,000 snafu uh, or you know something go wrong, there's still money to be made. And that's the, that's the deal. When you go in and you find really undervalued properties where lenders will put up the money based on the after repairs value, there's usually, there can be, not usually, but if you, if you find the right deals, there's so much margin to work with that it's enough of a security blanket, even for the inexperienced. And, and again, that's what this video is designed for is the assuming that if somebody's saying, I want to get involved in real estate and I have no money, I'm assuming that also represents a, a limited amount of limited to no experience, right? So finding these deals gives you such a big cushion that even if you have little, little capital, and even if you have little experience, you can still make it work. Now, uh, every deal is different. You know, this, this all needs to be wrapped in a really big qualifier of like, you know, every deal is different and every situation is different. And by no means am I giving specialized or individualized investment advice. But in principle, you know, if you're borrowing, if you're able to acquire a, a, something that has a $400,000 plus future potential value for half that amount in debt, uh, where somebody else puts up all the money because there's so much margin that they don't require a down payment, then that's as close to a sure thing as you can get in real estate. And I think that this deal even illustrates that because what should have taken six months ended up taking two years and we're still going to make money on this deal. That's the power of this approach. So, you know, the Airbnb approach is probably a little less scary, but as you know, you know, using the model that we showed that I, I showed you just now, you know, you saw 800 to $1,500 a month. The other model might seem a little more scary, but we're also talking $100,000, $150,000 in profit if it goes well and maybe less if it doesn't, but still profit. Um, so, you know, it's, it's risk reward. That's the trade off between the two approaches, but neither one of them requires any money out of pocket, okay? So that's two examples of how you can do deals based on actual deals, actual properties in the universe. Now you'll notice one of these is in Atlanta, one of these is in Houston. Those are both two markets that have some pretty good fundamentals. Not all markets are created equal. I don't know if you could, uh, you know, do, do, you know, fix and flips in Tokyo, for example. I don't know if you could do Airbnbs in London with the same results. I'm talking, you know, but here's the thing. I don't live in Atlanta or Houston. Um, you know, you can go to a market. You can learn about a market. You have to get resourceful, but you maybe find somebody in that market and partner up with them. You do what you got to do. And that really leads into um, kind of the next, the, 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 really the last thing I want to say, which is like, Everybody wants this stuff to just be easy. Like people want it to be beyond easy. 
Um, they want it to be both easy and, and guaranteed and certain and no risk and smooth and hiccup free and, and uh, you know, always to go exactly as forecasted, always predicted. Again, you know, I started the conversation with a mindset conversation. I'm going to end with a mindset conversation because even though I've given you two great tactical methods, they still don't work if you don't also do the work on yourself. And the, I'm talking about working on your ability to tolerate risk working on your ability to perform under pressure, working on your ability to frankly to sell. That's why I have so many videos on my channel about sales because you know, at every turn you're selling, you're selling the lender on your ability to do this. So, trust me, they'll, lenders, sometimes they'll say yes, sometimes they'll say no, and there's, no there's, there's nothing on paper that was the difference. It was just because they didn't get, you know, their, their lizard brain told them that you, you didn't sound credible, right? It's, you know, you're, you're, trust me, once you get in to start doing the work, if you do the latter, um, you know, contractors will push you around if you let them. You gotta, you gotta, you know, sell them on being the client that they take good care of. You gotta pay them on time. You gotta conduct yourself professionally as the 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 lender releases construction money to you. Because in that hundred and thirteen thousand dollar construction amount, you know, they'll release money to you as the as the work gets done on the house. You've got to be consistently, reliably, and in a timely manner paying the subcontractors or the you know general contractor if you if you want to go that route you've got to just be a professional and so people want this stuff to be easy and they want to not ever feel anxiety they don't want to take any risk they don't want to have to you know be accountable and and you know the internet obviously if you're seeing this you're seeing this on a youtube video the internet kind of has this this culture this atmosphere of like let's just make everything sound and look easy well look I just showed you how you can make, you know, tens of thousands of dollars in passive income or even $100,000 plus, all, both using other people's money, other people's assets and not coming out of pocket. You know, that's, that's pretty gosh darn good, but I can't make it so that you don't even have to be a professional. You don't even have to be able to communicate and you don't even have to, you know, be, you know, of basic competence and diligence to do this. And, um, you know, not to like belabor the point, but just unfortunately a lot of the internet, you can go, you can click off my channel and go watch other YouTube channels that make it sound like there's just nothing to this stuff. Um, I'd rather tell you the truth than just tell you what you want to hear. Um, but frankly, these, it's still pretty darn good to be able to do these kinds of deals with, with no, with, with other people's money and other people's assets. So anyways, and listen, if you're, uh, watching this and you're like, okay, well, how do I get started? get started the answer is you get get started you you stop watching you turn i appreciate it. if you've watched this video this far you've you've done me a solid you've given me good love the youtube algorithm is going to consider this a very engaging video because you watched it this far you don't even need to watch it to the end stop watching go do the work go start researching properties on air dna go start looking through tax records go start looking through mls go start talking to friends go start talking to family go start you know just building yourself up. Go start trying to analyze deals. Go start doing the math on how much properties are renting for. You can look that up in the, the ML, your local um, you know, real estate database. If you're in the US, it's your local MLS. How much properties are renting for? How much uh, for long-term rentals? How much properties are renting for for short-term rentals? You know, finding the pockets. Maybe you have to look out of your own market. You know, it's the way you get started is you get started. Okay. Hey, I think that's all I'm gonna say about that. I've got you know, there's, there's probably five or 10 videos worth of stuff we could talk about here. Um, but I think that's enough for now. Hopefully you're fired up. Hopefully you've got a sense of which of these two methods might make the most sense for you. And you're going to go start uh, again, they call it bird dogging. Just go out and do the work to find good deals. If you don't have money, you're going to have to invest time. That's the other thing I think the internet does people a disservice is they kind of present this idea that there's some magical, you know, strategy or system or, or hack or whatever out there where you can invest neither time nor money. And that's not the case either. I've been doing this a long time. I've been doing this since 2008. I've been making a full-time living online uh, through digital marketing and in the background also doing real estate investing. And I promise you, there's nothing out there where you don't have to invest either time or money. So make peace with that. 
go put in the time, uh, get your head in the right place that says, I believe in myself, I know I can do this, and I'm willing to do the work because I know that if I wanna have what most people don't have in this world, which is passive income, freedom, flexibility, uh, a life less ordinary, if I wanna have what most people don't have, I need to be willing to do what most people aren't willing to do. That said, Godspeed, go get it. Uh, I appreciate your time. Subscribe to my channel, if you would, if you're into, if you know, my channel's all about how to use marketing, sales, investing, entrepreneurship to build the most extraordinary, amazing, incredible life possible. I believe we live in a world now where um, this just there's just a ridiculous quality of life that's accessible and available for most people. They just they just don't know about it or they haven't bought into it. They've that you know most of us have been trained by schooling and by society and by our jobs and by our families and by people who love us and mean well for us, but they don't know either. And so we've been trained to just believe that this incredible life isn't really possible, well, take it from a guy who, back in 2008 when I started, uh, on the internet anyways, I was a, a broke, out of work jazz musician, um, and uh, you know now have been able to build an extraordinary life for myself. Essentially, I've, I've done exactly what I just described, which is you know believe in bigger possibilities for your life and get after it and do the work. Um, take it from me, it is possible, and you can do it too, and my YouTube channel is devoted to teaching you how and to showing you how and, and hopefully to proving to you and inspiring you the belief that you can do it. Um, so if you'd like the sound of that again, I'll invite you to subscribe and either way, I'll see you on hopefully the next video. Thanks for your time. Take care. Yeah.